Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is going to be a recent reads video um, for the little bit of uh, fiction I've been reading in between uh, the non-fiction for non-fiction November. So uh, I've got Fox by Dubravka Ukresic, the uh, Croatian author who fled to uh, Holland during the, uh, the Yugoslavian Civil War. Uh, James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room, which is part of the um, Penguin Great Love series. And finally, uh, I'm assuming it's fiction, it's kind of hard to know. This is uh, Robert Gall, who's a Slovakian writer. This is called Naked Thoughts and is uh, very much a series of epigrams. And this is translated by David Short. But let's start with Ugresic, um, who's one of my favourite writers. This is her, probably her most recent novel published um, 2017 and translated from Croatian by Ellen Elias Bursac and David Williams. Um, not one of my favourites of hers, I have to say. It's m too, too much about sort of writers and books and the survival of books and the sort of writer's reputations. So the first two chapters are, uh, the first one is about a book that has sort of um, dropped out of sight and the second one is a book that may never even have been written but there seems to be a lot of talk, historical talk in archives of other people reporting that it was written. And both the authors involved suffered from uh, Stalin's purges and they disappeared out of sight. And the books or the um, space uh, inhabited by the book have only been preserved by uh, women, and this is, I think, key to the whole of this book, really, be it lovers and partners or even secretaries. The, you know, these women have preserved these books' life after the death of the male writers. Um, I found them sort of quite uninvolving. I'm not that interested in, in that subject matter, to be honest. And then we have another chapter where uh, it's, it's, there is, there's an eye character in here who I take to be Ugresic, but this is a work of fiction. It's kind of hard to know. But there is a, a writer figure who goes to Naples to uh, be on a panel where she's totally overshadowed by a more well-known and older female writer. And then they kind of hang out in Naples after the event. And it's rather didactic what the older, you know, the wisdom that the older female writer gives to the younger one. And again, peculiarly uninvolving. But then we finally come to a chapter that I really, really liked and, and sort of, to me, reminded me of why I like Ugresit so much. This is not about writing at all. It's not about publishing or anything. It's the I figure, uh, a fan of hers, uh, an elderly man has died and has left in his will a house, a summer house in Croatia in, in, in the uh, countryside there. So she goes to sort of, you know, have, decide what she wants to do with it. And when she gets there, she finds that it's inhabited by this guy, um, which we've come to find that he, he he's a friend of the lawyer who handled the whole sort of transaction of the house. Anyway, she says, she doesn't kick him out. They sort of, you know, hang around. and She starts tra transforming this house uh, to more to her taste. And it turns out this guy is a mine clearance guy. He sort of removes what mines have been sown in the, in, during, the Croatia, uh, during the Yugoslavian Civil War. And it's a story about, you know, people without a sense of home because the I figure, the female figure, is returning to Croatia, the place of her birth, to decide whether she wants to keep this house or whether she wants to live in it permanently or whether she's going to sell it. And both of them are sort of displaced Croatians back in their homeland, but both feeling somewhat estranged from their homeland, which has changed, you know, what with ethnic cleansing, a change, even though Croatia now has independence, it's sort of gone to, you know, to call it a right-wing uh, government, sort of echoes of its sort of infamous uh, wartime government that was basically a Nazi puppet state. Um, and I thought that was a really good, a really good chapter. And then the one other chapter that I enjoyed that, that was successful, uh, even though it's about sort of writers and the legacy, is it's about Nabokov. And uh, Nabokov and his wife have had to move to New York. And they were both big butterfly uh, collectors, mad keen sort of um, they're, uh, le lepidopterists, that's right. And they want to go on a, on a trip through the United States on a sort of butterfly hunt to, you know, find and keep species that they've, they've you know, that are new to them. But they have no car. 
And Nabokov is teaching Russian to three uh, mature students, and one of them offers to uh, to drive them down to the Grand Canyon and onto California. And she's called Dorothy, and it's sort of from her point of view. Um, there's one hilarious scene where they're on the ver they're on the sort of fringes of the Grand Canyon, and uh, Dorothy. Uh, uh, it's her underwear hadn't dried the night before, so she, she's gone commando uh, under her skirt. And a butterfly lands there, and it's a butterfly that um, Nabokov, you know, never seen before. And it's just a very, very funny scene uh, about <laughs> so Nabokov. The way it's described is, it, it, you know, there's this, you know the place of sex uh, and genitals, but Nabokov is completely uninterested in, in the woman. Uh, sort of flesh that he's asking to be revealed not because he wants to look at it but because you know the butterfly is perched there and I don't know if it actually happened in that way he certainly named the butterfly after her so that, that you know there's some grain of truth to it um, but also we get this you know the, the idea that uh, Lolita where it's like a road trip and all the motels that um, Humboldt Humboldt stays at with Lolita it was very much sort of informed by their tour down to the Grand Canyon and all the motels that they stayed. So, you know, the, there, there, there's two fabulous bits of writing in those two chapters. There was a point to be made about the women, not muses so much, but almost sort of secretaries who preserved this sort of great art long after their, their men had died. And the final chapter was sort of quite poignant, quite melancholic, because... Uh, the I character, again, I assume is Ugresic, because there's a lot of complaining about she's only at such a stature as a writer that she is not immune from the change in taste in political taste in Croatia that mean that she is deemed, her writing is not deemed to be, you know, patriotic. And she comes in for a lot of criticism and they try and disrupt her tours in other countries where she should be supported by the Croatian consulates and, you know... Um, uh, sort of arts councils and, and, and the, you know, she has the opposite. She receives the opposite treatment because they're not in favour of her. She's not a big enough name to be immune, you know, to be so internationally renowned that no government could afford to sort of t disown her. Um, so there's that level of melancholy and I think that, that probably is true for, for you, Chris, which is why I think this is slightly autobiograph autobiograph autobiographical biographical that's the word um but there's the last story where she finds herself teaching in a creative writing uh class and one of her female students comes up to her and, and they're discussing it and this the thought suddenly strikes her that will she the ugresic character will she play the secretary the supporting secretary to this woman's work in the future help preserve it help ensure its heritage when no one is doing the same for her and as I say, it struck me as a very melancholic book. The image of the fox, uh, who's a sort of duplicitous uh, character through folklore, um, is sort of used of writers in that they will steal anything uh, in order to put it into their books. But I didn't really feel that was very terribly sort of coherent or insightful either. So I was a bit bemused by this, really. There's two, as I say, two fabulous chapters. Uh, which are on the level of five stars, but the rest of it sort of dragged it down. So I sort of give it three and a half stars. And on to James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room, my first James Baldwin. A lot of people were talking about it at the end of last year and on into this year on Booktube. Um, there aren't any likeable characters in here at all, which wouldn't necessarily mean it's uh, not a book I would enjoy, uh, but you have to work harder to, to <laughs> if, you, if there's no characters as a way in for you. But it's not just that, it's, you know, it's a deeply misogynist book. I'm not saying Baldwin was a misogynist, but all the characters in here are misogynists. Even the women don't seem to like themselves as women, that they're very much expecting and hoping and their aspiration is to become a wife and, and rear children. And I know this is a book of its time, of the 1950s, where that was still a sort of prevalent attitude. But, um, yeah, it, was, it, was, it left a nasty taste in the mouth in that respect. So it's a book about uh, an American guy his mother has died, being brought up by his father, and he, uh, his father is not a great talker, uh, but a great he is a great drinker, uh, and he has uh, a sort of um, formative experience with a, a male friend of his, where his, the, his that he's staying with his friend overnight. His friend's parents are out, and, and they have a, 
what you assume is a sexual relationship. I mean, it seems, it seems to be a sexual relationship. And the main character is so sort of disgusted by it, um, because this is the 50s in America, um, that he, you know, he sort of cuts off all contact with the boy and he joins in the sort of persecution and tormenting this boy at school and, and all that sort of thing. When he when he's sort of older and I assume out of university, he finds himself in Paris and he meets up with an American girl and and they become engaged uh, to marry. And he, for some reason she decides to go off to Spain to think about it, um, leaving him to his own devices in Paris with no money. And as part of that, he, he sort of hooks up with a, an acquaintance of his who's an old queen in Paris because he knows he can get money off him. So, you know, not a great basis for a relationship. But uh, in hanging out with this guy, they go to a gay bar um, and he sets eyes on the, way, on the barman called Giovanni, the eponymous Giovanni, and they start a, a torrid affair. Uh, and he sort of moves into Giovanni's room, which is on the edge of, of Paris's suburbs and is not very nice. It's in a, a state of transition as, as, as the Giovanni is sort of redesigning it uh, in theory to his own tastes. Um, and all through this relationship, uh, the main character knows that he's going to have to make a choice when his uh, fiance comes back to Paris. Either they will marry, in which case he, he sort of casts off Giovanni, or either she will reject him or he will reject her and he will hook up with Giovanni. But he, he knows in his heart of hearts that he's going to go down the conventional route and, and have a heterosexual marriage. So that, that's the plot of the book. I won't spoil how, how, you know, which choice he makes in the end. So the first thing to say about Giovanni is that it's, it's not really... There's two sides to him that don't seem to add up. So, you know, as a sort of flirtatious, confident gay man, he seems to be totally self-possessed and, and know who he is. And yet we get this description of the room, the sort of state of chaos and dirt and everything, that, his, it, that sort of represents his, inner, his true inner life, a bit like sort of uh, the picture of Dorian Gray, only the picture is, is the state of his room. And the dirt and, and everything is really well described, you know, the disgust that it, it, it brings up in, in the other character, in his lover, which we know is his own self-disgust. And what Baldwin's language is really good at is on the language of desire and disgust, and he keeps flipping from one to the other, in all the characters, really. But it, I, couldn't, I couldn't mesh the two sides of Giovanni. But it's really, it's really the main character that, that, you know, that there's a problem with. He's, he's, he's really very, very emotionally cold. Um, you know, he doesn't treat anyone well, really. But it's, again, you know, Baldwin sort of works against that really well when he sort of describes that, that this character is really angry with Giovanni because he's so... Uh, attracted to him and so in lust with him that it sort of it casts off the shadow of, of the one night stand back in America in that he knows he now likes boys he can't deny it anymore and now after the you know the during the relationship with Giovanni he finds himself staring at boys in the street in Paris you know and he you know he's angry at Giovanni because it sort of pushed him out of the closet uh, not publicly necessarily but in his own mind he cannot deny anymore that you know he is attracted to men as maybe as well to women, because, you know, as much as he's sort of weighing up between uh, his fiance and Giovanni, it doesn't stop him having a one-night stand with, a, with another woman in Paris, um, you know, to prove to himself that he is straight. But he knows all throughout that, that he, you know, he's not attracted to this woman, that he finds her disgusting. Um, but really, he's disgusted at himself, and, and you know, he's, dis he's disgusted at his homosexuality. And he thinks that, you know, by being disgusted at, at, at this woman who he has no attraction to, that somehow that levels the playing field, that it's, it's OK, it's legitimate to find men attractive because you can be disgusted by heterosexual sex with women. It, it just doesn't add up. It's, 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 it leaves a bit of a nasty taste in the mouth, uh, really. There is some fantastic writing. He does do desire and disgust really well. I do like the metaphors of the room because Giovanni's room, as I say, is small, cramped, dirty, which is equated to how he sees his relationship with Giovanni. And when his fiance comes back and they, they get a, 
a temporary sort of you know red to temporary place which is big and bright but he's just as uncomfortable there because what he doesn't like is being tied down it's having any kind of domesticity that that's really what he's railing and, and re rebelling against so yeah oh not great really three and a half out of five and finally on to uh robert gals naked thoughts i don't really know how to uh present this to you because it's all done in sort of uh aphorisms which is you know fine but i don't know if it's an homage to the art of aphorism you know after montaigne and others or whether it's a pastiche or whether it's supposed to be both at the same time i read this book in 15 minutes on a tube journey you know it's only about 50 pages i don't know if that's the right way to read it you know maybe i should read one page a day for 50 days or something and just sort of just contemplate what he's saying so just to give you an example aphorism 25 the fundamental attribute of a vicious circle is its incompatibility with history 26 the ambition of laboratory mice 27 the fear of ignorance natural in philosopher in a philosopher leads it directly to a phobia of infants 28 God won't be any the worse for a spot of megalomania. 29. There is nothing so inverisimilitudinous as a verity. So, you know, some of those seem sort of reasonably really profound. I mean, I did like the, the, the first one. The fundamental attribute of a vicious circle is its incompatibility with history. And I like the humour of the ambition of laboratory mice. But then, God won't be any the worse for a spot of megalomania. Well, that's cliché, really. Um... The fear of ignorance, naturally a philosopher, leads him directly to a phobia of infants. I'm not sure if that's profound or, or trite. There's another one here that I did particularly like. Hammers seek to convince nails that holes exist. Holes seek to convince hammers that nails exist. Nails seek to convince holes that hammers exist. So, and that's pretty much it, really. His previous book I didn't get on with at all because it was, although it was sort of aphoristic, it, it did have a narrative. It was trying to drive forward a narrative, but I didn't feel that worked. This doesn't really have a narrative. Therefore, you'll return to the form of the aphorism. And, you know, there, there's absolutely a need for witty and pungent and profound sayings in a sentence or less, or a short sentence, in, in this 21st century. Um... But I'm not sure this is it. I meant to say, I, for, I, I forgot to read, that this has one of the best uh, representations of art and writing that I've ever come across. In his text, The Art of Circus, Viktor Shklovsky says, Every art has its structure, that which transforms its material into something artistically experienced. This structure finds its expression in various compositional devices, in rhythm, phonetics, syntax and plot. A device is something that transforms non-aesthetic material, imbuing it with form into a work of art. And I think that is absolutely on the nail. It's why I don't think memoir is, re is reality. It's art, you know, it is what, what Shlosky says here. It transforms non-aesthetic material, i.e. the material of somebody's life, imbuing it with form into a work of art. Um, every art has its structure, that which transforms its material into something artistically experienced. So I think every writer writes autobiographically, but there are artists and they transform that autobiographical material into a work of art. So there you have it. So uh, towards the end of this week, I shall be doing my uh, non-fiction November wrap-ups. There will be the one specifically around the non-fiction November prompts provided by a book olive. And then, then there'll be one or two rather ranty uh, videos about a couple of non-fiction books I read, which weren't part of the, the prompts of non-fiction November. One is a, bi is a, me uh, sorry, a biography and the other is uh, psychogeography. And uh, I talk at length why I didn't get on with either and why I think I wouldn't get on with either form. Uh, you know, not just these specific books. Okay, so till next time, thanks very much.